called What's Rice? Uh, Police Brutality in Rochester. Uh, my name is Ataja. I graduated from U of R in 2014, and I was actually a member of SDS, uh, both my junior and senior and part of my sophomore year. Um, and now I'm one of the members of Black Building Leadership and Community Knowledge. If you guys have seen any of the recent rallies in Rochester, we've been a part of that too. Um, so I'm glad I was able to moderate this panel today. Um, so um, before we start the event, I actually wanted to do a minute of silence because the non-indictment decision for Eric Garner was released today. Uh, some of the people who have been watching social media might have seen or heard that John Crawford's non-indictment was released today. That was not released today, that was back in September, but it happened very much under the radar. So I would like to do at least one moment of silence um, for Eric Garner, John Crawford, and Mike Brown not receiving justice. Um, so we're going to begin actually with uh, Jaria, one of uh, the students of SDS, giving a description of the organization. All right. Um, hi, everybody. Like Natasha said, my name is Daria. I'm a member of Students for a Democratic Society. And SDS is an activist network that seeks, seeks to create an educated community um, dedicated to engaging issues of social, racial, environmental, and economic justice. It, it maintains a vision of democratic society where people have control of the decisions which affect them and the resources on which they are dependent. SDS provides an open democratic forum to engage in discussion and organizes meaningful direct action to incite change. We meet every Tuesday at 9 p.m. in Ruth Merrill. Um, that's on Wilson Commons first floor and students, workers, and community are all welcome. So that's just a little word. Thank you, Daria. Um, so to kind of introduce the panel, I'm actually just gonna read the event's description because I think it really covers um, what the goal is today. Uh, so the tragic death of Mike Brown, the subsequent response by protesters in Ferguson, Missouri, and finally a Missouri, Missouri grand jury's decision not to indict Darren Wilson has brought national attention to a vital issue plaguing the country, police brutality and lack of police accountability. These issues affect everyone, but disproportionately affect marginalized communities, including people of color, immigrants, the deaf community, and the LGBT community, along with others. Rochester is certainly no exception. In the past year, there have been numerous incidents of police brutality, many in which the officers have not been brought to justice. So today, we are joining you of our SDS to learn what incidents have happened in our community and how we can better empower ourselves to combat police brutality through knowing our legal rights and what steps we can take next. Uh, I also want to mention the co-sponsors today, which include the Black Students Union, Douglas Leadership House, Graduate Students of Color, American Sign Language Club, Student Association for the Development of Arab Cultural Awareness and the Paul Burgett Intercultural Center. Uh, so our panelists today are Kaylin Rich, Ted Forsyth, and Anansa Benba. So I'm just going to read a quick uh, bio on each of our panelists. Kaylin Rich uh, joined the NYCLU family as a Genesee Valley Chapter Board member in 2008 and became Chapter Director in 2011. The community organizing experience that dates back to stuffing folders for her parents' union meetings Nonprofit administration and young adult engagement. Formerly, Rich was the community affairs coordinator at Planned Parenthood of the Rochester Syracuse region, uh, where she was responsible for legislative advocacy, government relations, coalition building, and the regional campus organizing program. Rich has also worked at Services to Aid Families, a rape crisis domestic violence program in Oswego, and as the director of the SUNY Oswego Women's Center. Rich is a contributing editor for the independent queer feminist blog. Auto Straddle and the sexuality educator for Sex Discussed Here. 
Which serves on the founding board of Connect and Breed, a taboo-breaking, non-judgmental after-abortion hotline. They said in upstate New York. She's a board member of Image Out, the Rochester Lesbian and Gay Film and Video Festival, and a former board member of Planned Parenthood Advocates of New York State. Rich holds a bachelor's degree in Women's Studies and English from SUNY Oswego, and graduate certificate in Nonprofit Management from SUNY Brockport. She's currently completing an MALS in Women and Gender Studies at SUNY Brockport, and in 2011, she was national counsel. Uh, she was a 2011 national counsel for research on women, young professional fellow, and they're building the next generation of women in the nonprofit sector fellowship program. So I would like to do a round of applause. <laughs> Our next panelist is uh, Ted Forsythe. He's filling in for Pastor Nina Ward. Uh, Ted Forsythe is a founding member of Enough is Enough, a local response that formed as a response to the incident with Pastor Nina Ward's husband, Benny Ward, in uh, May of 2013. While waiting for the bus during the war, Amanda's husband was thrown uh, from his wheelchair onto the ground by the police. He was kicked, punched, and beaten in the face by uh, RPD officers. Uh, eyewitnesses attest that this treatment was in response to Mr. Ward, Mr. Ward remaining in place as he waited for the bus after he was told to move on. When Ida became aware of the assault, she gathered community support, rallied, and she and Ted helped form the Methodist Network. Enough is Enough is a local response fighting for community dignity and actions against police brutality in Rochester. Enough is Enough aims to organize and defend the Rochester community against police brutality, racial profiling, and the corruption rampant within the RPD. Aside from being a founding member of Enough is Enough, Ted is also a founding member of the Flying Squirrel Community Space, located at 285 Clarissa Street. The space exists to provide a welcoming space to cultivate and sustain long-lasting relationships between artists, activists and community members in Rochester to create positive social change. He has also been doing this for 10 years. He started working with the Rochester Indie Media Collective in 2006. In his downtime, Ted loves to read, heavy both literally and figuratively, nonfiction books as well as writing essays. So a round of applause for that. Our last panelist is uh, Ananta Benba, a good friend of mine. She is a senior at U of R from Albany, New York. She studied linguistics, is the vice president of the Black Students Union, and is a resident of Douglas Leadership House, as well as a member of Black Building Leadership and Community Knowledge, an organization that we're both members. So give her a round of applause for now. So I want to give the panelists um, a few minutes, about five to seven minutes, to really explain um, what their organizations do, um, how you work with and around police brutality and uh, it's a little more about yourself. So Katie, can you start? Sure. Uh, so I'm from the New York Civil Liberties Union. We're the state affiliate of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. And uh, we have 50,000 members across the state. We are an organization that defends the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So the guaranteed rights that the state gives us through the contract is the Constitution. Which means we fight, it's a boring way of saying we work on a lot of different issues, uh, racial justice and police reform being some of those issues. We also work on LGBT rights, immigrant rights, reproductive rights, due process, uh, battling discrepancies in the criminal justice system that are unconstitutional, freedom of speech, lots and lots of other things. Um, I'm supposed to talk tonight a little bit about knowing your rights to the police. And I should say we do have good resources around this on our website and uh, in print, we have something called a bus card that you can print out and take to a rally or a protest with you that has all the information about what your rights are when confronted with the police in your home, in a car, or on the street. I want to preface all of this, though, by saying that, uh, especially today, it feels important to say that while knowing your rights may help some people some of the time, the reality is knowing your rights can also get you killed. And when you're dead, your rights don't matter. And I think it's really important to remember that, even as we talk today about knowing your rights and where the lines are, and if people have questions about that, I'm happy to answer, it's also important to recognize that uh, one person walking down the street who is white and another person walking down the street who is black may have very different experiences when they try to exercise their rights. And that's just reality. And there's also a whole other conversation beyond rights that's about survival. So not only teaching people their rights, but giving them the tools to survive a police encounter is in some ways just as important or maybe even more important than you having the, the precise legal knowledge of what your rights are. So I'm happy to answer questions about your rights with the police. Um, 
you know, I think it's I should not, not to lose sight of the fact that it's very important to know your rights. I mean, it's very empowering to know your rights. If we could take every single uh, kid in the Rochester City School District and arm them with this knowledge, maybe that would make a big difference if every single kid had that knowledge and sort of collectively they had the power to stand up and fight back. Um, the reality is that's just not where it is right now. A lot of people don't know their rights. On top of that, a lot of people don't have the power to exert their rights, even if they do know them, because they're afraid, because they are rightfully afraid of what might happen to them if they do that. So, as an organ, you know, I, I don't know if that's really what I'm supposed to be saying on behalf of my organization, but <laughs> I think it's important to acknowledge it as we have this conversation, especially in the wake of Mike Brown and Eric Garner, who are not the first or the last in this line of of dead bodies that we will that we will see and that we have seen. I also think we have to <coughs> think about this in an intersectional way, in a large way. I'm glad you brought other communities into the picture. Um, it is not just black men who are affected by police violence or by corruption in our criminal justice system. Today I'm also thinking about C.C. McDonald, I'm thinking about Marissa Alexander, uh, I'm thinking about Renisha McBride, I'm thinking about the mothers and the families of these people who have been wronged by our criminal justice system. So to hold all of that in check is really important. So happy to answer questions about knowing your rights when we get to that part. I just want to give a shout out to, to some work that's going on in the community. I'm also the co-chair of the Coalition for Police Reform, which is a relatively newly formed group in Rochester, uh, comprised of a lot of different organizations, and we would love more organizations to join us. And it's sort of brought together black clergy and black communities in Rochester with sort of the more progressive, mostly white, honestly, groups that are also interested in working on race. But we're working towards actual reform in Rochester. We have a couple things that we're interested in. Um, one is getting in on this body camera conversation, which we have to have a nuanced conversation about because just getting the body cameras isn't going to protect us. Although body cameras do have potential to uh, improve police community relations, whatever that means. They really do have potential, but there are things that to consider when we talk about it. They're not going to stop the problem. So body cameras is one thing we're working on right now. We're pretty sure we're going to have body cameras in Rochester in the first half of the next year. We've already met with all city council members and we have the support. We're working now on getting policy in place that both protects citizens' rights as, as well as uh, sets up clear protocol for how, how law enforcement would use this information. We're also working on advocating for an independent civilian review board in Rochester, something we do not currently have. We're also working on stop and frisk which we know is out of control in Rochester, and uh, working to both get better information about stop and frisk so we can hold the police department accountable, and also working just to end racial profiling, which is a huge, it's hard to say, how are we gonna end racial profiling? It has to be a systematic, a cultural change, but that is one of the things we're working on is addressing racial profiling through addressing stop and frisk. And the last one, which is currently being worked on in New York as well, is trying to get a search consent uh, decree in Rochester, which is this new idea. And the idea is that one of the major issues when it comes to low-level offenses that uh, mostly black and brown kids are brought in for, low-level weapons charges, low-level drug charges, is that they are patted down or frisked or searched without their consent. However, a lot of, like you talked about, or like we're talking about right now, a lot of people don't know their rights. When a police officer says, open your bag, and you open your bag, you have to some degree consented to the search. So what we're trying to get is to get a policy in place where police would actually have to say, if they don't have probable cause to search you, you have the right not to consent to the search. So the onus is not on the individual to say, I don't consent, but on the police officer to say, you have the right not to consent, which sort of flips the power in that situation. So those are the four main things we're working on. We would love for um, anyone here that's interested to be involved. We're meeting this Friday at noon, which I realize is not a time that works for a lot of college students. So we're also working on a time that will work better for more people in the community. Uh, but definitely see me if you want more information on that and, and how to get involved. Yeah, my name is Ted Forsyth. I'm with a group called Enough is Enough. Um, came, together, came together over the uh, really brutal beating Benny War received um, in May 2013. Um, since that time, we've uh, taken stories and, and uh, uh, intakes with people that have gone through abuse, harassment, profiling, um, and taken some of their stories and publicized them, gotten them out. Um, shortly after Benny War was attacked in May, at the end of the summer, and, and, and again, I know there was a lot more happening between May and August, but um, 
Dwayne Ivory saw a marsh that another self was doing and came up to uh, the pastor um, and asked, you know, if he could share his story because he got beat up and his home surveillance video caught it on tape and and so we uh, we sat down with Dwayne and we did an intake and we got a story and um, you know it, it, it you know showed a situation that was pretty pretty calm uh, and, and then escalated almost instantaneously into violent brutality and um, you know he was another person that uh, you know is in solidarity with enough is enough has been to the meetings has been to the parades the, mar the marches the speak outs. Some of these books, he was on one of our panels that we had last May. Um, and so we do all kinds of things. We, uh, we petition, we march, we, um, you know, uh, done court support. We go to the court with the people that have charges against them and sit with them, stand with them, work through that system with them. We had these Enough is Enough t-shirts made up with Benny Ward's face on the front or in the back, back. Defense and uh, and ju the judge did not like that. Uh, he um, the, the the case kept being prolonged, and then he got to the point where basically, you know, he passed the buck. He he handed it over to another judge. But what we were hearing from Benny's lawyer is that he was putting pressure on the lawyer to say, "Don't allow those people into my courtroom wearing that shirt." You know, and I mean that that to me shows the power of people. Like if we come out and we come together and we support each other, we can make an impact on the system. And he got. So frazzled by the fact that he was getting a lot of negative publicity, that he wanted this case gone from his, his document. Um, so yeah, I mean we do we do we do stuff like that, um, lots of different things, and we really try to take cues from people that have been at the center of these incidents. Um, but Pastor Orr was supposed to be here tonight. She is ill and could not be here. So uh, one of the things that she was asked to do was give sort of a a brief history of um, sort of uh, policing community relations. So I wanted to just touch on a few points. Um, uh, last year I looked into a story from 1962. Um, it was uh, this gentleman named Rufus Farewell. And he was a gas station attendant on Columbia, I think it was Avenue Street, forgetting which. Anyways, uh, 19th Ward, he's over there, he's doing his job. It's like 11 o'clock, and he's closed up his shop. And he leaves the shop and this police cruiser rolls into the parking lot. And the DNC and the Times Union were the kind of two papers that are vying for the story. And the DNC reading their coverage was very pro-police. The Times Union was much less pro-police and much more interested in it felt like it knew the truth. Um, but he came out of the gas station with the keys and cops rolled in and they're like, what the hell are you doing here? And he's like, oh, I'm closing up. And he showed them the key to the gas station. One of the police officers opened the door and knocked him to the ground. Both of the police officers got out of the car and started beating him mercilessly. He got up, he pushed them away, and started staggering across Columbia Avenue to Barney's Pub, which was across the street. And Barney knew uh, Rufus because he was a patron. He came in and out of there occasionally. He really worked at the gas station. And as he's crossing the street, an off-duty detective sees this black man running from, or moving away from, two officers. And so the off-duty detective stops his car, jumps out, and chases after Mr. Farewell. And so eventually, Mr. Farewell, the detective, and the two officers converge on Barney's front door. And there are two different stories. One is that the police officer went back to punch him or hit him or something, and his baton broke the glass. The other story is that he was uh, pushed through the front glass window. Um, after that, uh, Mr. Farewell you know, came into the bar screaming for help. Um, Barney, the, 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 the guy behind the counter, was saying, what the hell is going on? I know this guy, he works at the gas station, why are you doing this? And then Mr. Vero clutched the bar and wouldn't leave. He clutched it like death grip, like he wouldn't leave. And so at that point, the detective was trying to de-escalate, according to the papers, that situation. And um, he kept telling him, you know, go with the officers, they'll take you downtown. Or no, they'll, they'll, you know, go to the officers, they'll take you to the hospital, they'll get you fixed, fixed up. And then, um, you know, you're just going to deal with this. We're just going to walk through this process. And eventually, you know, and Mr. Farrell was like, no, I'm not going. I don't trust them. And so eventually, Mr. Farrell reluctantly went with these officers. And um, the officers were told by the detective to take them, take, take him down to the hospital. 
The officers disregarded that order and took him down to the station, where they again beat him mercilessly in an interrogation room. Um, he was bailed out the next day, and my neighbor, Alice, actually was the secretary for the lawyer who worked on his charges, criminal charges. We he was charged with um, assaulting a police officer or something like that. Um, and, and, and Alice is like in her 80s. Uh, and, I, and I asked her about this case, and, and she just got this tunnel vision and said it was the worst thing I've ever seen. Um, last year, I also had the opportunity to interview a judge, a federal judge in Buffalo, who is 94 years old. He was the prosecuting attorney against these officers that beat up Mr. Farewell in, uh, in, in Rochester when, when this case happened. And he said he didn't take any notes, he doesn't have any recollection, or, or, or he didn't have any like, you know, notes or files or data on the case. But he did say that he explicitly remembered the case because it was such an atrocious abuse of power. Those two officers were eventually acquitted of all charges. Um, in 1964, they were, they were charged uh, with civil rights violations. They were eventually acquitted. And um, Mr. Farewell has passed since. But the family has kept that story very close because um, of the threat of retaliation. When this happened in 1962, uh, those same officers, from what his son told me, came to their house and directly threatened that family. They said, if you push this, we will kill your whole family. And, and, and that, to me, is, um, is chilling. Um, and it, it, to me, speaks to the fact that there are, there is a veneer of community police relations, but there are stories like this embedded in our community that you don't hear about, and you don't know about, and you don't see, and they're not, not reported on, and they're so atrocious that this idea of police community relations is almost a sham. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, just uh, briefly, in 1963, the Police Advisory Board came into being. <clears throat> and it was sparked partly by Rufus Farewell's case. The PAB um, was comprised of all civilians. Uh, it had advisory and investigative powers. And um, it could come up with uh, recommendations and results from its investigation and pass it on to the chief. If the chief and the PAB agreed on what the recommendations were, great. If the chief and the PAB disagreed, the PAB under law was, was um, allowed to release all evidence, testimony, and statements to the press and allow the court of public opinion to determine what really happened. Um, and, and, and basically, uh, the police didn't like this, so they took out full-page ads in both the DNC and the Times Union denouncing the PAB. The police union filed three uh, federal uh, injunctions against it, stopping its tracks from doing its work, claiming that it was unconstitutional. And after um, nine years of injunctions, the courts finally ruled that it was constitutional. And um, but, but, but by that point, the damage had been done. Uh, in 1969, the Republican administration took over. They uh, cut all the funding from the PAB. And in um, 1970, it was dissolved. From 1970 till about 1980-ish, <coughs> maybe mid-80s, um, there were groups working together to try to fight police brutality and abuse. Um, fight is one that comes to mind instantly. I know they had working groups and they were struggling and they were fighting not only for, for you know, against police brutality and, and, and murder, but, but for, you know, jobs, for quality housing, for quality education, um, basic human rights. Um, so uh, then in somewhere around the, the mid-80s, uh, another group called uh, United Church, or United, I think it's United Church Ministries uh, came together and that was sort of headed by Reverend Raymond Graves and Reverend Louis Stewart, I believe. My history is, I'm still, I'm still learning about all this stuff. Um, and, and they were pushing for a sort of a revamp of the PAB. They wanted to see that put back into power. Um, 
but uh, Wade Norwood, who was the city councilor at the time, uh, submitted an alternative. What we have now is the Civilian Review Board, and that alternative basically, um, you know, uh, was passed in the law a week later without public comment. Um, the the, the uh, United Church Ministries actually denounced it because they said they weren't given enough time. And um, what we have now is a system where the police, 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 and the chief decides what happens and nobody knows anything for the fact. Um, so that's all to say that there are communities in, our, in Rochester that are targeted, and those communities um, don't have justice, and they, you know, they, um, yeah, they, they, it just, it's, it's an ongoing problem. This idea of police community relations to me is, is unreal. It's, it's a sham. It, it doesn't mean a whole lot. It's a public relations fiasco. Um, and then uh, just, uh, sorry, no, I'm going really wrong here. Uh, you're giving the whole history, or you're giving a very, very brief history of the long history of police brutality, police Yeah, yeah. Which is important. And, and the, the only other thing I would say is I just want to read some of the names of um, uh, people murdered in Rochester by the police. Um, I think it's important. I know that this has been read at some of the demonstrations over the... And Did you it, also it, read their ages? Yeah, I do have their ages here. So this is on Rochester Wikipedia, or uh, this is on the RPD on Wikipedia, so everybody can go and look at this stuff. Uh, unidentified Negro motorist, uh, age not available. Uh, uh, shooting, he was shot on July 25th, 1967. He died. Uh, no, actually it could have been a her. There's no gender listed here. Um, Ronald Frazier, 19, 1975, shot by James Soles, who was a police officer. He died, outcome, of, outcome uh, to the officer unknown. Uh, Denise Hawkins, 18, age 18, uh, shot November 11, 1975, by officer Michael Leach, died. Michael Leach was then promoted to captain. Um, let's see here. Alicia McCuller, 21. November 13th, 1983, shot by Thomas L. Whitmore, death, she died, uh, outcome of the officer unknown. Kenneth Jackson, 25, November 16, 1984, uh, shot by Seferino Gonzalez, he died, outcome for the officer unknown. Uh, Luis Davila, 17, September 30th, 1985, shot by Carlos Perez, uh, Luis died. Uh, James Gale, 24, October 12, 1985, shot by Alan J. Lucidi. Uh, he survived. Um, the officer pled guilty to departmental use of firearms and was suspended for 31 days. Kelvin Green, 30, 1988, shot by Gary, Officer Gary E. Smith. He died. Gary E. Smith was suspended without pay. Vandy Davis, 21, 2001, shot by David Gephardt. He died. David Gephardt was promoted to a lieutenant. Craig Hurd, 14, June 10, 2002, shot by Serge Savichev and Hector Padham, uh, twice in the head. Uh, Padham goes to Greece, New York police, and Savichev goes to Fairport police. William Carter, 46, August, shot August 15, 2002. Uh, there's no listing for the officer who shot him. He died. Uh, the grand jury deemed it justified. Bashadika Mason, 13, uh, July 10, 2005, shot by Mark Simmons, uh, survived gallbladder and several uh, feet of her. Oh, several feet of her intestines had to be removed. Uh, Mark Simmons was promoted to sergeant and special assistant to Chief James Shepard. Patricia Thompson, 54, March 2, 2006, shot by Officer Jeff Lafay. She died. Uh, the grand jury deemed uh, it justified. No, no charges against the officer. Uh, Jose Luis uh, Casado, 19, uh, shot in 2008 by officer Ryan Hickey, uh, shot in the leg. Uh, he was sentenced to life in prison for firing at police. Uh, Ryan Hickey was praised by Chief David Moore for his conduct. Miguel Cruz, 21, March 1st, 2010, uh, shot by officer Daniel Santiago. He's, uh, 
Miguel survived. Uh, the grand jury deemed, um, the grand jury uh, said that the shooting was justified. Hayden Blackman, 43, October 13, 2011. He was shot by Officer Randy Book. He died. Uh, the grand jury deemed that the shooting was justified, and actually Officer Book was then uh, given a commendation by the, the, sh by, by the chief. Um, almost done here, and these are not everyone, clearly. Um, that last person, I, I, uh, this is up to 2012, Israel Izzy Adino, he was 20, um, shooting date was June 21st, to, June 21st, 2012. He was shot by Sergeant Aaron Coletti, Sergeant Mike Nichols, Antonio Gonzalez, Brian Callick, Greg Carnes, Onassis Sokol, and Eli Uid Rodriguez. He died, and the grand jury deemed the shooting justified. Um, the last case there that they list here is Yandino. He had mental health issues. He was incidentally killed on the same day that his father was shot and killed by police um, about uh, 20 years earlier. Um, and uh, it was an execution style shooting is what people in the neighborhood called it. He had a, uh, he was experiencing mental health issues. He was not functioning well. He had some sort of a BB gun, a rifle with him. Police say that he raised it, and these officers all shot him simultaneously. So that's, that's just up to 2012, and more stuff has happened since. Um, but just, just to give some context to the severity of the problem, and those are just the shootings. We're not even talking about police brutality, uh, uh, racial profiling, harassment, abuse, retaliation. Those are just the shootings that are big enough to put on Wikipedia. So. I'm, I'm going to end there, but I'd be happy to talk more about all of that stuff. Yeah, I just want to emphasize, thank you, Ted, for giving that history, because that history is really hard to find. Not surprisingly, there is no, there's no national record of police brutality incidents or even just murders of uh, five police officers in this country, so there's certainly no um, track being kept of it here in Rochester. So, it takes this kind of you know, talking to the community, individual case by case, searching, hunting work to even get that list, which I'm sure is very complete and only goes up to 2012. Hello, everyone. Um, I am a uh, part of Black Building Leadership and Community Knowledge. Uh, we're fairly new, well, really new. Uh, we formed um, this past mid August after the Mike Brown tragedy. Um, I guess so. Our our mission statement, our main focus is to empower the Black community and uh, emphasize the value of Black life and also build unity between people of, of the African diaspora. Um, we focus on Black as a culture, not a race. So we understand that we have many different um, different cultures, different you know, in Latin America, in Africa, here in the America, in the Caribbean. Um, it's all different, and we, and we see that and honor that. And so through that, we hope to. Um, combat disparities that were created by institutionalized racism. Um, some of the things that uh, we've done since our inception, I guess you want to call it, um, early fall we had a, a Black Lives Matter, Matter rally where we were part of that um, on Tennessee Street. Um, we've, uh, the information that we give out is always uh, information from, from the perspective of black people. So any um, documentaries that we've shown have all come from the perspective of a of an African perspective as opposed to a Eurocentric perspective. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, more recently, I guess, to fast forward, um, well, a few members did go down the same route as uh, the Ferguson, and we brought a lot of that energy back, and we're really wondering how can we um, get something going in Rochester because we realize the similarities between Rochester and between <coughs> St. Louis and Ferguson. I mean, we realize that this is an issue that affects the whole country. Um, so more recently, uh, the, after the no indictment announcement from Mike Brown, there was a lovely Warren had sent a call out for a rally this past Sunday, um, and then Adam McFadden uh, canceled, announced that the rally was canceled. So as Black, uh, we picked it up. Um, and so we began advertising, began organizing, um, and it turned out in a rally of about 500 people um, at one point, what the official count was. And um, by that, the point of that was really to um, build community and empower people. So, so I mean, just being out there, people being empowered, knowing that we can come out here, we can protest, our voice can be heard, and our voice will be heard. 
um, the route that was taken was very strategic in that um, some of the things that we, so we started in Liberty Pole downtown um, and that was beautiful. We had different artists um, sharing their, their artwork um, and then uh, so we walked past, so we walked throughout downtown so that of course is a big deal but the, a couple main points that we hit was Xerox, um, the Monroe County Jail. Um, which was beautiful because you could see um, inmates with a small window kind of um, bang on the window and support. Um, and then the school, the school board building? The, yeah, the board of education. Okay, the, thank you. That building. Um, yeah. Um, what else? What else? Um, so yeah, so our main focus really is our, is our community. Um, looking at the black community, how can we empower each other to know that we don't need the police to do such things, that we can do that, and that we can build community ties. Oh, that's what I was going to say earlier. We really patronize black owned businesses. So every you know, month, there's new black owned businesses that we're posting about, we patronize, um, we take uh, pictures with them, we post it online, on Facebook, so you can see and patronize black owned business because um, money has a lot of power, and by keeping the money in the community, where it's not, you know, another form of empowering the community, but also um, enriching our community and really giving money back uh, to our people. Um, thanks, guys. So yeah, I guess I wanted to ask um, some specific questions for each of us. Um, Kaylin, you talked about the fact that we uh, know your race is a big piece to this, but it seems to not make much of a difference in a lot of cases. So I just wanted to see how many people have seen or at least skimmed the, the ACLU palm card before? Show sure of hands. See, a good amount of people have seen it. Uh, also, to give you a sense for later, but the question and answer who have seen those things. Um, so I guess knowing the kind of things that the palm card uh, says, because I've read it before, things like you know you don't have to consent to search, uh, things like that, right? um, asking whether you're being detained, whether you're being arrested, mm -hmm. things like that. With recent um, police brutality incidents or what you've seen in Rochester, so kind of. Either what rights have you seen not respected, or which ones you think are worth a you know, really important to think about? Sure, that's a good question. So I think all of them are really important, obviously. Um, and knowing your rights, even if your goal is to survive a police encounter, is still really important. Because you can do things to protect yourself, even if your rights are being violated. So at the ACLU, and people have different opinions on this, but at the ACLU, we recommend that people in, in, in the interest of surviving a police encounter, that uh, you do your best under the circumstances to be courteous with police officers. And the reason why is to not escalate the situation into a violent situation. Uh, that said, there are things like you just said that you can do, words that you can arm yourself with. So even if you believe a search is unconstitutional, you can still say, I do not consent to the search. Even if you're being patted down, even if they're already looking in your pockets or looking in your things. There are things you can say and do to at least try to exert your rights. So um, <clears throat> the things to remember are, uh, in, in really brief, because there's there's a lot, but I think the, the things that everyone everyone should know. Like these are things that it would be great if everyone knew them, then you decide how you interact with the situation. Uh, one is that you don't have to answer a police officer's question unless they have reasonable suspicion to detain you, which is a really intimate, like it sounds like a lot of things if you're not familiar with the language. Uh, what that means is that a police officer comes up to you and asks you a question, where are you going, uh, what are you doing, etc. You can say, instead of answering, you can say, instead of answering, uh, am I being detained? And what you're asking when you say that is, do I have to stay here and talk to you or am I free to go? The other way to phrase that is to say, am I free to go? All of that said, we also, I, mean, I also always say, like, if you are in a situation where you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have anything on you, and you want to get out of that encounter alive, and it seems more expedient or smart to just answer the question, then by all means, you make that decision about what's going to be best for you. I'm never going to stand up here with all the privilege that I carry and say, like, yes, you should always say, am I free to go? You should always fight back against the police, because it's not always going to be possible, and that would be just disingenuous of me up here with my, my class privilege and at least on this coast my, my racial privilege to say that to everyone here. So you need to make those decisions for yourself. But you should know you're not legally, you don't legally have to stay and talk to the officer unless you're being detained. So when you say am I free to go and they say yes, you can go. You do not legally have to consent to a search unless they have a probable cause. You do not legally have to show ID again unless you're, you're being arrested. 
So all of these things. You don't legally have to give a police officer your name or your address or your social security number or any of these things. Again, all in the context of like, yes, know this information, use it well. Also know if there's a situation where you feel like maybe you are not safe, that you need to make decisions about what information you're willing to give up, what information you're not willing to give up, and how you're going to reserve your rights. So those are the things to remember. Am I free to go? Am I being detained? Am I under arrest? I do not consent to the search. And those are sort of the basics. I mean, that's basically what's in the palm part. There's additional information specifically about when police are coming onto your personal property, like your house or, or your apartment, or uh, searching your car, that sort of thing. But those are, can I answer the questions, Yeah. OK. Yeah, and I guess um, if you want to add anything in, but I guess this is more directed at Ted, since you've done a lot of um, interviews with uh, victims of police brutality, some of those interviews even have a video. You've seen the videos of Betty Ward's attack of, I forget her name, but the pregnant woman, that same friend, Greta Hardaway. Hardaway. Greta Hardaway. Um, I guess in a discussion of rights, what are some of the things you've noticed that the police haven't followed through on? Like, for example, like Betty Ward was waiting at a bus stop. What, from a legal perspective, what kind of injustice did you see happening in that situation? Or if you would like to add anything to that. But where, where have the police gone wrong in the incidents you've seen? You know, just basic violation of our constitutional rights to be able to walk down a public sidewalk without being bothered or harassed or waiting for a bus and, you know, uh, being, you know, having the right to stand there and wait for the bus or sit there and wait for the bus and, and then having, uh, you know, being pepper sprayed and thrown out and, and, you know, injured severely because you refuse to comply because, because they told you to. Um, I, uh, I witnessed, I did some cop watching uh, at the Flying Squirrel the other night, I mean, so maybe like two weeks ago. This video will go up on the internet, don't worry. Um, and it, it was uh, this guy, uh, this officer, Eisler, and he was stopping, he was waiting on a side street for this car to leave, and it was um, a car with, I think, four uh, black teenagers in it, and they were driving away from this housing complex where they were staying with a friend, they were you know, hanging out or whatever, and I saw that car go by out of the front of my eye, and then I heard this engine rev really hard and just spin over there with the lights going and everything. I was like, oh, uh, really? So I, I, what I do now is I carry a camera on me at all times. So whether that's a flip cam, which is like a little tiny, it's like a rectangle, it's got a record button, you just click it, it shoots in high definition. Or if you have like a, my, I was there with my friend Andy Dillon, and he had a, um, he had a cell phone with a good camera lens on it, and he was uh, re able to record too. Um, I saw the stop, and I started walking over my camera shooting, and uh, the guy's got the window rolled down, and the officer's like, get out of the car. The guy's like, what am I being pulled over for? Get out of the car. What? I just want to know what I'm being pulled over for. Get out of the fucking car. And the guy then opens the guy's door, steps into the door, and you hear the handcuffs snap on his wrist and he pulls him out of the car. And I'm just shocked. And to his credit, he was de-escalating. He was saying, I, I, I'm going to remain silent. I want to speak to a lawyer. I'm not going to answer you. I'm not, I want to know why you pulled me over. He was very clear about his rights, which I thought was impressive. This cop was totally out of order. And I feel like once he knew that people were filming him, he got out of there as quick as possible. And then two other cop cars came by, as he was still there. Two other cop cars came. The guy was arrested and, and, and driven away by the first cop. Two other cops, was a captain and another patrol officer, and they were sweet as pie. Oh, my name is such and such. I'm a captain. Here's my card. Here's my name. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is what happened. You know? it, was, it was such a switch once the cameras came out. And that's from two white men filming these cops. I have no idea what that interaction would be like if I had a black or brown, you know, trans, queer, I don't know. I don't know what that would have been like. But in, in my, my, my body, that was like the, the reaction. So, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Did that answer that? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely an example. I mean, I've lived in Rochester not that long, I've already seen some of the things. So, for me, that's a, that's a very simple question, but I think for some people that have seen it, like, it's a matter of like 
those things that you know you can't do, those rights that you know you have. I mean, I think that's a really good example of how you should stay calm with the police. Um, just try not to let the situation escalate for the safety of yourself, but sometimes it really um, doesn't change anything. And we, we all have a legal right to uh, observe the police and tell a police officer that you are, um, you have a right to film them, you're not obstructing justice or stopping anything, you stand to the side. Uh, and that's what you should do if you observe police brutality anywhere. Um, pull out your phones, stay in a safe distance away, and record what's going on, because that may be the only way that anybody knows what's going on. Um, so, Nata, I guess, if you want to talk more, I know you talked about the rally on Sunday, um, but if you want to say anything about, I guess, the significance to black communities, uh, especially of police brutality, and maybe even why we were at Liberty Pole. So, I actually have to so I did not know the route beforehand. So oh, I like right, it. you were Yeah, so I don't, I wasn't at the meeting for that. Um, <laughs> we keep people in the ground. Yeah, very well. Um, but, so, specifically being downtown in a very central location, um, where you have, where you have community members, where you have people in the suburbs who are driving in and out through downtown, um, the rally was important, one, for the black community because, um, so I'm a college student, I'm not from Rochester, I don't want to be. Um, but the fact that people from Rochester saw that the community needs to be brought together somehow and that a way to do that could be in Black Lives Matter rally. But we're out here, we have black, we have young, so one thing about black is we're young. We have young black people out here getting other young black people excited and then um, also getting older black people excited to come out here and really make a statement about em 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 emphasizing the, the value of black life. Um, that's really important. Um, so, I, and I want to add um, another part of the rally. There was a second, there was a component in the beginning um, where uh, students from teen empowerment were speaking. Um, and for me, I mean, these students aren't that much younger than me, but they are younger than me. And so uh, for me, it was really moving. Um, I think for a lot of people, it was, it was really moving and inspirational to hear such young people articulate themselves so well and understand that police brutality is a systematic is a systematic issue created on you know created in the country where racism was basically um, fueled the economy you know with slavery and stuff and so um, to hear young people out here really excited I think um, brought a, a new vibe and a new energy and kind of uh, kept the morale up the whole time because now we're now listening to young people everyone kind of gets it and i think a lot of times too a lot of older people sometimes feel that us young people don't understand what's going on we're not paying attention we're glued to the tv stuff like that and so i think by us being out there it kind of showed no we're paying attention we're active we're trying to take we're, and, 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 and we're taking a stance on the situation um and so i think as far as building community and, and empowering people i think the rally serves its function um that is. I mean, I guess, sorry if that was a lead question about Liberty Pole, because um, I forgot that you were not part of the organizing around. For us, the significance of being at Liberty Pole is that um, a lot of high school students get out of school, and Liberty Pole is a part of uh, Maine and East, which is near where all of the buses stop in downtown Rochester. So a lot of high school students, when they get out of school, they don't have anything else to do. They kind of hang around Liberty Pole. Um, and the city has very much shown that they don't want them hanging there by blasting classical music out of the Sibley building and all kinds of things. But frequently, that's a place where interactions between high school students and the police happen. The police are, you know, when school gets out, the police are right there um, and ready to see students doing something wrong, ready to harass them, ready to let situations escalate to kind of get what they see as a problem kids off the streets. These kids really are just going somewhere after school. Um, you mentioned that it was a systematic issue, so I want to kind of open this up to the whole panel. What does it mean to you that uh, the idea that police brutality is a systemic issue? And if you can kind of identify you know, what you mean by that, what systems are in place. And this is for the whole panel. So I think by systematic, um, I think one thing that's important to highlight is the implicit biases that people have when you're born into society where white supremacy and white privilege exists. And um, you're born into families that um, perpetuate certain ideologies. And these are things that you just don't know or not, and are not aware of. And so when you have things like racial profiling and such, and when you're a police officer who is raised in a family um, that 
in a white family um, and you have your white privilege, and, but like you don't understand how to use your white privilege to combat the system um, and you're racially profiling people, I feel like in that sense, <coughs> for me it's systematic just because that idea of white supremacy just being a system that constantly dis disenfranchises black and brown people, um, that dealing with police brutality is not just as simple as um, you know, like the cameras or other things, it's really getting to the root of the implicit biases that were created, um, I mean, in this country, um, from slavery and such like that, and I deal with black people being inferior, my and you know, black people being superior, and black people just being emotive and angry and aggressive, and you see this narrative told over and over again throughout history, um, and it's never actually dealt with, um, and so I think just, just that, just like implicit biases, kind of the people not understanding that they are racist and that they are perpetuating the system by the way they act, the questions they ask, and the assumptions that they have about uh, black people. Yeah, I mean, I think what I agree, what we're talking about is structural inequity. And um, there's this way of sort of visualizing the way structural inequity works. And uh, you may have heard this before. So like, imagine that we were doing an exercise where everyone took off their shoes, you know, cover shoes. We made a big pile of shoes up here, and then we redistributed the shoes. But the shoe you get back might not be the same as the other shoe you get back. It might not be your size. It might not be a style that fits you. It might not be uh, a gender shoe that you feel comfortable with. You might not be able to walk in it. So everyone now has two shoes. We're all equal. That's equality. We have two shoes. But we don't have the shoes. Some of us have shoes that fit us, and some of us don't have shoes that fit us. And that's equity. That's not having equity. And the structural inequity we're talking about, we could like make the list and it would be huge, right? And I think that as long as we are, we're gonna keep having this conversation, we're gonna keep fighting this fight, as we have for a long time, and as we will keep fighting, but as long as we have a criminal justice system that's based only on punitive reform, only on punishing people for things that we perceive them to have done wrong, instead of addressing people as whole people, as long as we have a culture that upholds sexism, and transphobia, and homophobia, and classism, and racism, and you could go on and on with this list of, of isms that our culture upholds, as long as we have all of that, we will have structural inequity and we'll have a criminal justice system that is run by people in power to punish people with less power. And I think that's that's the structural issue. I mean, none of these things I talked about before, consent decree, body cameras, we're gonna fix that, but um, overall our movement has to be keeping that in our framework, even as we chip away. I mean, those are both great answers, I agree. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just, uh, I, I guess I feel like the institutions of this country are founded on like genocide of Native people, uh, white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy, um, you know, imperialism. Um, and these are all connected, um, and, and these are all creating a barrier to, you know, true liberation to people having the means to, to live their lives, to do what they need to do, and until those institutions crumble and new ones are built that are built on, uh, like you said, equity, um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see reform as being the end all. I think we need reform to make people's lives better along the way. But I don't see reform as the end. I see the actual deconstruction and reconstruction of a of a new society as sort of the, the, the future. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask uh, if anyone, you know, maybe specifically Kaylin, uh, wanted to talk about. I know we've talked a lot about uh, people of color as victims of police brutality, but we haven't had a chance to really talk about the LGBT community or the black community or other uh, or immigrants also. Uh, if you want to speak anything about that. Yeah, and I think anyone, actually there's probably a lot of expertise in this room, like anyone should feel free to jump in at any time, especially since we're like half and half <laughs> um, black people and, and not black people up here. But, uh, but we do work on those issues, yeah. I mean, I think that that's the thing, is we have to look beyond just talking about young black males, although young black males are really important. Uh, there are lots of people that experience police brutality or are the victims of police misconduct. Um, Especially in our country right now, I would say undocumented immigrants also live in a state of constant fear 
and literally, in terms of the law, have fewer rights than anyone else living in our country. And we believe at the ACLU, we believe at the NYCLU, we believe that the Constitution is not just about legal citizens of the U.S. We believe the Constitution covers everyone that is living here and that calls America home. And so, undocumented immigrants should have constitutional rights too, but right now, in terms of what kind of rights they have, they literally, they literally have none. And the violence is not just the raids on uh, places where, where immigrants live or people who are perceived to be immigrants. It's not just being harassed by the police. It's deportation. It's being separated from your family. Uh, it's, it's the conditions in detention centers where people are often denied medicine or denied access to their families or transported halfway across the country where they are in a detention center where they can't even see their families before they're deported. Um, and it's the fear that people live with. And I think fear is a recurring theme among everyone that experiences marginalization, over-policing, all these things, whether that's transgender people, whether that's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer people, whether that's immigrants or people perceived to be immigrants. Uh, what we hear about our office, we have a lot of people that call us with, with issues and we like you know make referrals to other agencies and that sort of thing. Um, and we hear from our friends that work in immigration and our friends that work directly with immigrants, and we hear sometimes directly from immigrants, people who are afraid to call the police. And it's not the same story, but it's very similar to what we hear about from, from people in over police neighborhoods, where, and, and literally they're afraid of, uh, there's, there's, a, you know, um, there's a domestic abuse situation, a partner violence mm -hmm. situation, and the victim is afraid to call the police because they're afraid they're going to be deported because there's a history of that. That is what happens. Right. Um, we, a couple years ago, got a call from someone who, called the police, or I'm sorry, I didn't call the police, called 911, didn't call the police, called 911 for an ambulance because their husband was having a heart attack. The ambulance came, but because of the way our system works and because of how we treat immigrants and the lack of rights they have to privacy and other things, the 911 dispatcher also alerted the police who alerted ICE and when that uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And when that person who was having a heart attack got to the hospital, when they woke up from, when they were you know, released, they were released into ICE custody. Mm. And deportation proceedings started from there. So people are literally afraid just to ask for help. And I think that's, that's a thing we see in, in a lot of different communities. Um, it, it, and it all intersects. I mean, I, just, I was just reading today some new statistics on transgender women in immigration custody to tie all these issues together. Uh, and 40% and of transgender women who are picked up by immigration are housed in the facility that is incorrect for their gender. So they're housed in, in male immigration centers in, on, the, on the male side of, of these um, deportation buildings. So I, all, so I don't know. I mean, I could go on and on. I think, yeah, those are some examples of how things intersect. And we, we hear about all the time. I think as a community, we need to work harder on connecting those dots, though. I mean, I think even in our coalition table, and Ted's part of that, and we often just talk about it as a black male issue or something that only affects the black community. When it does affect, especially in Rochester, affects the deaf and hard of hearing community. Uh, and the queer community and the trans community, really communities for all of these things, right? Um, so we need to be having better conversations about that and just being more inclusive in how we think about this work. Because I think we're only going to win if we all rise up together. And one of the best ways for us to fail is to be kept in our silos. Um, I think something that um, Ted mentioned briefly, um, people with mental health issues interacting with the police is often a problem. Uh, you talked about the 911 call and kind of the fear of calling the police. I did hear a story, and I forget what state it was in, of a woman who called 911 because her husband was threatening, threatening to commit suicide, um, and they sent police over there to assist with the situation. The police got into an argument with the man, um, and they actually shot him, and they killed him. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this kind of fear of what, you know, calling the police for, and Brenda Harder was, was uh, a call for, uh, on behalf of domestic violence. Someone was called the police and that's why they arrived. And even if you call the police to help you, there's, kind of, there's definitely a sense in many communities that they may not help and they may actually hurt you much more. Um, so you guys have actually talked about a lot, so I wanted to hand it over to the audience for a question and answer. Uh, so I, I just wanted to kind of touch on what Kayla was saying too and expand upon it as well, because I think you said it just at, at the end of what you were saying. Um, <clears throat> anytime I, I hear somebody say something along the lines of, you know, refoc or like expand our focus beyond, you know, young black males, especially when it comes to police brutality, um, that 
instills a certain level of fear in me about why are we doing that? Because if we turn it from you know Black Lives Matter to All Lives Matter, then what have we really accomplished? Kind of thing. But I think that the idea of intersectionality is super important because what it does is actually draws in, it, it expands our field of view to the people who are natural allies, to the people who are not allies, to the people who are who are uh, accomplices in this, to the people who who uh, their very life depends upon it. So when you think about like, for instance, uh, the undocumented community, the black community, the trans community, about people who are affected by police violence, people who are affected by um, uh, mass incarceration or incarceration in general, in a really, really either disproportionate or nasty, nasty way, that the reason that we want to draw those conclusions together and bring those intersections together is not so that we take the focus away from young black males, but so that we say, these groups of people need to band together and need to fight together. And the only way that you can have enough people to overthrow the system that's right. in place right now is to have all these groups come together and recognize we aren't allies. We are all in this. We're all getting beat by the police. We're all getting mass incarcerated. Um, you know, We're all having seriously nasty conditions when we're in prison. Um, and then we can start the conversation of, we're all going to help all of ourselves by getting rid, rid of this. We're natural ally. All trans people in the multiple trans communities. So um, absolutely centering around people who are directly impacted. And I'm going to be quiet because it's what I just said is I should shut up, but I totally agree. <laughs> uh, other questions? Are there questions? Yeah, you didn't mention that the guy was um, de-escalating the situation. Uh, Exercising his rights, uh, you know, be silent and this and that. And that. But for people of color, in my experience, I have a lot of experience um, dealing with the police. Uh, when you exercise your right, you are escalating, just going along. Um, so now all of a sudden, I'm in the back of the police car mm -hmm. for for my brake light up. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Whatever time I'm in the back of the police car until he wants to let me out. Um, rarely is exercising your right um, de-escalate because it's like you're challenging mm -hmm. your authority. Um, yes. And with people of color, man, it, it's, it's no matter how macho I want to be, in the back of my mind, I could be Mike Brown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so now I have to weigh out, do I want to be um, Mr. Thug, tough stuff, or do I need to try to get home? Mm -hmm. You know, telling him I'm not going to say anything right. or anything. Bare minimum, I'm going to be held up for three hours. Mm -hmm. Don't let me get caught out there without my ID. I don't care what the law says if I don't have it. I don't have my ID. I'm not going home for a few hours. Mm -hmm. It just that's a reality. That's a reality. Even though the books may say I don't have to have it. Mm -hmm. um, so. I, I just think it's important that people of color um, don't think that that's the way to de-escalate. Uh, you really have to weigh each situation. Maybe in a situation where if you have some white allies taking pictures or something, mm -hmm. you could do that. Yeah. But if you're on your own, man, you need, you need, to, stay, you need to be safe. Yeah. You need to be safe, man. With that, with that. I, I just want to... Clarify, he seemed to be calm, and as he was asserting his rights, just as you said, the cop got angrier and angrier. And I, and I think it's because two of us, two white men, were filming this interaction that maybe maybe that played some role in the cop's behavior and the calling of the captain. And, but he was still arrested. He was still taken to jail. He was still, you know, and it, because he wanted, he wanted to fight. He wouldn't get out of the car and listen to the back of the car. I'm Brian Nguyen, but uh, a socialist in Rochester since 1980. So I, I have been a witness to a lot of the things with the cops in Rochester uh, that Ted uh, made reference to in his history of, of what's been going on, who they've, who they've been shooting over the years, and so on. Um, and I, I've been active also with, with some of the folks in the panel in, uh, uh, in this effort that seems to be bearing fruit now of, of getting the police to wear body cameras, which uh, has intrigued me. In, in, 
for a number of reasons. One is that in researching it, we found that it really seems to work in some respects. That is, the cities where they've been implemented effectively, the police change their behavior. It's because again and again when we find police misbehaving, they have an immense amount of discretion and power over people that they stop or face it. And, and some of them abuse it shamelessly, systematically, all the time. And so uh, part of what we want to do in Enough is Enough is kind of keep track of cops who do things like that uh, so that, you know, there, there's a spotlight shining on them. Uh, but apparently when, when in cities where cops were, had to wear the cameras, incidences of, of complaints against the cops went way down, like by 80%. The, the, the cops behave differently when they're not allowed to simply mess with people because they can. And so, and so that's one reason for, for supporting it. But I, I want to add, add a, an aspect that as a socialist uh, we have to understand, understand is that there's something structurally, there's a structural problem with the police and society anyway. That is, we live in a vastly unequal society where a tiny minority own and run things, and the vast majority work for them. And so the police play a role of serving and protecting property and those who own it. And, so, and, and they, they make use of all of the divisions and oppressions and so on uh, throughout society in this unequal society of ours. And, and their social role is, their job is to keep people in their place. Keep the people at the bottom at the bottom and don't let them think they can go elsewhere. And, and psychologically, some of them take on that role, but, but structurally that is what the police have to do, which as, as Ted mentioned, it's why reform isn't going to be sufficient. Eventually, we have to have a society where uh, you know, there isn't this division in classes of a tiny minority who own everything and a vast majority who don't. The majority have to run things in their own interest. That's where we can really work on the oppressions, the, 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 many, the manifold divisions that have been fostered <coughs> all these times just to keep the majority weak and the minority in power. I can, I mean, it can rain, it might get ruined, um, I can, I can break it, you know, anything can happen, so it's like something that says, this is the camera that needs, like, some type of, like, way of, like, checking that, that that's the camera, and that through police investigation of the camera, uh, the camera's not going missing, but, um, then you think about, I mean, Mike Brown's death was on camera, Timmy Rice's death was on camera, um, Eric Garner's death was on camera, and these are three cases, and, oh, specifically with, um, uh, Eric Gardner and Mike Brown in the case of where justice was not served, but we see everything on camera. We see like everything manifest, and so it's kind of hard to think that just because something is reported and documented like that um, justice is going to be always served. I think that something needs to be coupled with some sort of a like, policy. I'm not sure what that looks like. I'm not a policy major, um, but that something like policy would have to be coupled with the idea. We're actually working on it right now, so we want to make sure that whatever policy comes out supports the community as well as the police, and all of the documents so far have been around, uh, in terms of policy recommendations for body cameras, less than 50% of the couple hundred municipalities that have them even have any policy. And so a lot of what happens in those cases is when the cameras are on or off, is at the discretion of the officer. And I believe in Ferguson, I believe the officer is wearing a camera but it wasn't on. Yeah. And so there was- so the Right, yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, I mean, but I mean, even if we have the exact right policy, at the end of the day, we have to be careful about I'm 100%, it's unusual for the ACLU to support something that could be used as a mass surveillance tool. So of course we're having a lot of questions. <laughs> Where's the data going? How long is it stored? Who has access to it? How we protect privacy? Those things we're all really concerned about. And then in terms of them just being effective, the other piece is, is as you say, is like how do we ensure these are going to be used properly? And I think at the end of the day, even if we pass, if we even not pass, even if we uh, see Rochester ends up with cameras and they have good policy or okay policy, there's still going to be abuses of power. And so then the question is, like, how do we, how do we, where, where are the checks and balances there? Like, an officer turns off a camera, should there be an assumption of guilt, or should that, there be an assumption that, and that has no reason, no documented reason for turning it off, um, you know, and then they'll say it was broken, whatever. There's lots of things that can happen. I think what you were saying, though, I mean, the reason we do support them is what little evidence there is out there on them, which is not a lot, 
uh, is that they do seem to just make people act better. That's really what it is. It's not even that. It's a little bit that we have more evidence. It's mostly that if someone is wearing a camera and everyone knows they're wearing a camera and they know they're wearing a camera, with the exception of people that are going to act, that are going to be corrupt no matter what. Um, for the average person who just gets a little macho when they feel intimidated, they're going to be more polite when the camera's on. And that's really what reduces the complaints. It's not that the evidence is better necessarily so much as that people are just better behaved when they know they're being filmed. So, but yeah, you're right. The policy has to be right. We can't just, and I think we have to be careful though because the rhetoric right now, the national rhetoric, is to look at body cameras as like the solution. I mean, that's sort of what's happening right now, right? So we're saying, okay, well, let's just give everyone body cameras. And the NYPD is rolling out the, today, they posted on, on their social media, uh, that they're going to be pushing out the rollout of body cameras to all their officers by this Friday, uh, at, at the same day, coincidentally, as, as the announcement about Eric Garner. So we have to be careful that we don't let people just sort of like talk about that as the only thing, that we focus, we keep focus on the big picture while we support these things. I mean, we can support body cameras right now, but not let them feel like the end of the conversation. <coughs> There were a series of questions that people put their hands back up for you. And then if you had a question, so you had a question, you guys had questions? And then Mary. So, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Hey. Um, I'm Nick. Oh, um, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, so, there's some people behind me that can go, this is uh, probably actually still somewhere else. <laughs> Yeah, I was just wanted to highlight what you said about um, you know, like the need to ally um, and work as accomplices, um, because not only is it like, not only are we weaker in numbers if we're not standing together, but you know the divisions, you know, they they actually serve a purpose. They actually keep us from challenging. The power that actually, you know, as Brian was highlighting, you know, keeps you know, the, in the inequalities and inequities in the system here, um, and it's not if we allow ourselves to be divided. Not only are like if I can be convinced to hate on some black guy or you know an immigrant because they're black or an immigrant and they're supposedly lazy and all that. My attention is focused there, instead of you know where it needs to belong, actually challenging that. Mm -hmm. And you know, and once, and of course, once the cops are done, you know, busting in, you know, heads of people of color, you know, when you know when stuff like Occupy comes around, they're quite happy to use that practice of beating people up to come after you know white people. So we all have an interest in challenging this. I obviously day to day I don't see anywhere near you know basically I don't see any you know police intimidation by and large but you know that, they're still there you know yeah you know you know you get a large enough movement and such that actually starts challenging power they'll come after us too and we need to build that solidarity you know to keep that from happening and to stop it where it's already happening yeah, I would yeah, quick note. I mean, police in Rochester beat up protesters multiple times in pepper spray. Yeah. Um, right in the middle of the day. People I know personally, um, and those are also documented on the RPD and Wikipedia page. It's a really fun thing. So, we're doing a good job of the Rochester. The RPD Wikipedia page. It's me and Ryan April. That's what I'm saying. I thought it might be you. You're going to get all the footage, too. I was going to take whatever last questions. Yeah, I was just saying, in the interest of time, folks, if we can keep the, the comments short and the questions, keep the focus on the questions, that'd be great. We want to respect our panel's time. And so if you have a question, um, now would be a good time. If you have a comment, please make it brief. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you can answer this question for me, but I figured I'd put it out there because I'm really trying to get educated on this topic. Um, for a lot of these cases where people have been shot and killed, um, my question is, I feel... Like, it just seems to me like the police have a lot of other resources for, like, handling people when <coughs> things escalate. Like, they have tasers. I'm sure that they're, you know, probably trained on, like, you can shoot somebody without killing them and, like, things like that. So I was just wondering, like, if, like, why is it that, 
like guns are the first resort, and maybe they're not in all cases, like I'm not saying that that applies to all of them, but in a lot of cases it seems like guns are the first resort and then somebody ends up getting killed, but like there are other resources to handle people when situations get dangerous or ex escalate, so I'm just trying to kind of figure out what what's exactly going on with that, are there rules for that, are there not rules for that, like. I I do want to acknowledge, I think that you were right in saying that, like, not, not all cases, right. um, are the, are the police going to their guns first. I do feel like most of the time when cases with black and Latino like, people, it's kind of the first place they're going to go. Um, but, I mean, I think black life has been, like, under siege for, like, since we've been um, emancipated from slavery, emancipated from slavery. Um, and if we think about the way that oppression has kind of uh, rebirthed itself and kind of the idea of, like, lynching lynchings being very like open like form of execution it's just from in, in my opinion this is just basically a 21st century way to lynch somebody i'm going to put a badge on i'm going to protect it under the law um and i can do this because so many times again people have not been indicted they have not been found guilty so it's just continuing for lynchings of black people in america yeah i think that goes also for people that are not that are being oppressed by this, the system, whether it's, you know, black, Latino, uh, the trans community, the queer community, undocumented immigrants, uh, there's clearly a connection to that. I think there's a trend that right now that our police force is becoming heavily militarized. Yeah. I mean, literally. Yeah. Literally, they have weapons that are for war. <laughs> when you are trying to figure out why a police department has an MRAD, a, a military vehicle, you know, who's the enemy? <laughs> They're here to serve and protect the people who live here. <coughs> the enemy that they're fighting. Who are we supposed to be turning those weapons on? And unfortunately, in many of the cases, it's people who have done nothing. You know, um, assault rifles are like everybody has assault rifles now. I mean, really, even uh, you can go online and see where this like homeland security money is going. It is follow the money. It's all about money. Uh, there's all these dollars coming in to get basically military grade weapons. And even in like Steuben County, they got like a military vehicle for some reason. I don't know why. And I don't know what they're going to use it for. Uh, often what we're seeing, there's a trend nationally, we just came out and report about it actually, um, of them using these weapons going into like serve warrants, for example, like drug related <laughs> warrants, and then someone ends up getting shot and killed. There's a family whose baby uh, died because they threw a, a um, green flash grenade into their, flash bang, yeah, into their home and the shrapnel hit, hit their child, trying to serve a warrant for someone who wasn't even there on a drug related offense. I mean, this is what was happening. So you have to ask the question. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, I think, yes, they are trained in other de-escalation techniques. And you have situations like, do you remember the, um, what was his name, the kid that went in and started shooting up in the Batman movie? Oh, yeah. oh, no. He made it out alive. He made it out alive. He made it out alive. I'm not saying, we can't compare, I mean, like, apples and oranges, whatever, but in some cases, police do use discretion in terms of handling someone, even if they are perceived to be violent and dangerous. In other cases, they just look at someone and perceive them to be violent and dangerous even if they're unarmed. And that's that's the, the question you raised. I also want to just point out briefly that uh, for the last five years I've asked through a freedom of information request for the demographics of the RPD. Names, ranks, ages, races, genders, um, and if they live in the city of Rochester or not. And I'm actually going to probably have to maybe get a lawyer because the demographics for 2014 have not been released to me yet. Um, the last two years have been released to me within the two week span that they're supposed to give you the information. And speaking of militarization and demonization, if you grow up in a, a primarily white rural community or a white suburb and you have very little interaction with people of color, you may be trained to humanize people. So, you know, when you're facing the white guy in the theater, you're going to do everything possible not to kill him just to apprehend him. Right, right, exactly. And then if, if you come across like a, you know, a, a recalcitrant black man in a wheelchair who won't move at the bus stop, you're going to throw him out and beat the crap out of them. You know, then, you know, maybe that has something to do with how and where our police are coming from. In August 2013, the last time I had updated statistics for the RPD, um, 88% of them were male, 76% 76 76 of them were white, and 93% of them did not live within the city of Rochester. 93%. We have an occupying police force policing Rochester. This is, this is also part of the problem. 
Um, just to kind of quick add, I was actually thinking that as you were talking, the idea that a lot of times, even for me, being from Albany, more specifically, more specifically Troy, the police officers who serve the community live on the suburbs. Um, I think that there are certain protocols to communities, there are certain ways of life in communities, and if you're not in that community and you don't understand certain things, maybe, and you know, intimidated, or you know, you're, all your senses are heightened, and you know, you just freak out. Um, I'm not saying that that's an excuse, but one of the just, I think possible reasons is just like kind of not not understanding like each other's cultures and I do think that that comes down to the idea of power in the sense that um so I see language and I love it but the idea of like languages having prestige and people having to code switch to the more prestigious language and I feel like in America as like as um black and brown people as my friends, people were always trying to well we have to adapt and it's unfortunate sometimes conform to the system which is you know white male straight uh, you know, and um, in a sense that um, we don't have power in that situation. Um, I was like, oh, the power comment. Does that make sense? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yes, and so, um, and, oh yes, that's what I was going with. In the sense that we have to know how to act around white people, but white people don't know how to, don't, mm -hmm. don't have to understand our culture and the way we act. And so um, that kind of like uh, mis uh, judgment. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Ms. Kirsch. The quick way to get out of action on straight people, etc. Yeah. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. <laughs> <laughs> I see two hands, let's just do two. So, Quinn, uh, what are you doing? So, if you could give your question and then you give your question and then they can respond to both of them. Okay, I'm not sure who would answer, but my main question is like, how can like regular people, so people who are not part of organizations or who don't work, you know, yes. just not allowed to work, but or students, what can they actually do to combat police brutality <coughs> on a large scale? Like, what are everyday things that we can do so that the system does change? Um, is there any way to see the future and educational policy? Like stereotypes are a word. Like kids understand what they're like if they stereotype someone when they are growing and like if their parents are continuing to stereotype minorities and stereotype gender and stereotype LGBT communities, they're gonna continue to do so. So is there any way that an educational policy can be made in the United States in order for it to at least diminish in a certain way or a certain capacity? So so there was a question about what students can do to affect police brutality and how education is involved in um, and stereotype. So to answer your question, Sequoia, speaking from the perspective of, of a student um, in the city of Rochester, um, the idea, so um, just like want to use the example of this past Sunday, um, there were students um, who were at uh, the rally in the march, but the idea of kind of like leaving campus to go rent out. And so one thing that Makia, who, who's also part of Black and the student, did was she or um, she checked the bus lines to see which buses were running. She and like and and we posted that and advertised for that. And then she also called public safety to see if they can get a larger bus as opposed to the regular half bus. So I think um, as far as getting involved, one thing students can do is be more open to leaving campus. Um, I think that like, that's like the biggest thing to understand that we live in a community and there's there's like thousands of people on this campus who just don't leave. It's just like a huge population <laughs> in Rochester that does not leave. You know Wilson Ave. Um, and so I think um, that by, um, you know, I mean, like, doing a little bit, doing a little bit of research, talking to people, and, and, and like, seeing, like, what resources, resources are in the community, and to figure out, okay, how can I get there, what bus I'm taking me there, is this in walking distance, can someone give me a ride, people are, you know, and just from me, kind of, in turn, like, this, like, community, people are always willing to give rides, and talk mm -hmm. rides with Isabel, and Chanel, with, and Nick, um, at the ride, <laughs> <laughs> So I guess that's really the point. 
for us to understand that one, this is wrong, and then to make people who feel like it's right uncomfortable. And then I feel like hopefully over time that that can change attitudes and can kind of rearrange stereotypes, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's part in solidarity. Yes, yes. Yeah, part so, yeah. in so, of course, spreading the message. Awareness. Mm -hmm. um, and then agitating. Who would have this panel if there wasn't so much action going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's true. Um, if you guys want to respond either to the student question or educational policy. Um, I, I think it's important to have like media literacy. I guess this kind of touches on um, your stereotype question. I think if people have more media literacy and they are more skeptical of the media they see, right. and they get more sources of media, they will be able to discern more of a truth. And they'll be able to see, like Ronald Reagan uh, in the 80s concocted the whole war on drug things. You know who the targets were? So-called uh, welfare teens, black women, right? And that was the target, right? And that wasn't by accident. That was a specific um, campaign created to make black people the enemy, white people the good people, and black people have drugs and, and steal, and these stereotypes are crazy. And when you start to learn about these stereotypes, you start to learn about where they come from and the politics behind them, you can start to inoculate yourself against them. And you can say, oh, they're pulling the like, immigration thing right now, and Psh, whatever, and I can listen to that, you know? Um, and the other thing I would say is, I think, related to that is like, it's really important to like, Learn the radical history of where you live. Learn the unrecorded history of where you live. Learn the history of the most vulnerable people in your community. Learn the histories you don't hear in school, in this institution, um, in the news, in the newspaper, because they're not going to tell you. I mean, part of that is doing like, I mean, the work I do with indie media is reporting hard news, but also like getting oral histories from people. And, and even though they're conducted in interview style, what they are is they're really telling a, a story that you aren't going to hear anywhere else. And there's so much of that communal knowledge in this, in this city and cities across this country that can tell you about what's going on that you're not going to find out if you don't look for it. The last thing I guess I would say is right now you have, as students, you have this really amazing opportunity to use resources and have access to resources in this university that you would not have outside of it. And once you get outside of it, it becomes very difficult to find those resources. So I encourage you to learn as much as you can using these resources to understand the, the most vulnerable populations in this community or the communities you come from that don't get exposed, that don't get talked about, that don't get shared. The other thing I would say is leave here with a skill, a talent, an ability, uh, a, a career path that you can use in the service of the struggle to keep going, to change, to eradicate the system and build something actually far more, uh, uh, you know, uh, equal, uh, just, not equal, just, a far more just system, we'll say that. So, um, and then the last thing people can do, um, Benny Ward's lawyer is asking for people to come out to uh, court on uh, December 10th, which is next Wednesday at 2 p.m., it's at the federal building. Uh, Judge Marion Payson, um, basically what happened is he filed for uh, disclosure of documents, uh, discovery of documents that the police and city have. They've delayed. They don't want to share the information. And in that process, uh, he found out that basically uh, the city has a policy where they have to take any case of excessive force to a to the current civilian review board. Um, in Benny Worst's case, Benny filed a uh, excessive abuse, excessive violence uh, claim with the city, which should have automatically shunted his case to the CRB. It didn't go there. The city um, had PSS, their internal organization, the police, police themselves, and then refused to, to transfer to the CRB so that no other outside information could be gathered on the situation. No other witnesses were called. No other testimony was heard. Uh, only the people that went to PSS were heard. And then the other um, point of that is uh, um, ju just, just that, um, oh, I lost it. I was going and I lost it. It was bad. And it was bad. Basically, come out, come out to court. Support him. He wants this in the news. We want people to know about this. Enough is enough is going to be there. We want you to come out. 
and um, you know, just uh, get involved. Yeah, yeah we'll try to spread the information like that. So I guess. I just say two minutes of everybody's time, then then we're done. But firstly, we just get a huge round of applause. but we're talking about direct action. Those are the kinds of things that we need to you know, move forward on these kinds of issues. So you've got all these, these different kinds of groups up here. You've black, enough is enough. And of course, the NYCLU, but obviously SDS is, you know, we're here right on campus. We're students. So Tuesday, Tuesdays, 9 p.m. at Ruth Merrill. If you guys are interested in these kinds of actions, organizing these kinds of things, show up there. That's what we talk about. But also just in the next two days, uh, on Friday, directly speaking to this, these kinds of issues, there's going to be like hashtag Ferguson Friday action. Um, I don't think it's officially set yet what is happening, but tonight it will be out. Tonight it will be out, so be on the lookout for that.